Hello everyone and um, I guess welcome to today's webinar titled Landing Zone Strategies in Unconventional Shale Reservoirs. My name is Barry Huffer and I'll be your host for this event. I'm the Business Development Manager for Icon Science and I'm based in Denver, Colorado. As the name suggests, this is a science and social event, so I'll encourage everyone to get their favourite beverage while you listen to the talk. My colleague, Georgina Del Moro, will also be joining us as our panellist. She is the Regional Product Manager uh, for Wells and also based in Denver, Colorado. She'll be helping Lev with questions at the end of the talk. We are happy to be hosting today and I hope you all enjoy the session. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Lev Vernick. Lev is a scientific advisor for Icon Science. He's based in Houston, Texas. Today, he's going to discuss ways to integrate petrophysics with seismic using a rock physics approach. Before I hand over the mic to Lev, I have a few housekeeping items. Because it's a large audience, all attendee microphones will be muted. If you have a question, please feel free to send it through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your player. Lev will be answering questions at the end of the session. If we don't manage to get to your questions during today's webinar, we will follow it up afterwards. So with pleasure, I'll hand it over to Lev. Thank you very much, Barry. Very nice introduction. And uh, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, just one note before I start. If during the presentation, you're gonna hear a voice of my dog, don't be afraid, he is very friendly, but he has nothing to do right now but the runner up. So uh, the presentation today is called, uh, we, we titled it Landing Zone Strategies for Unconventional Shale Reservoirs. As uh, will be clear pretty soon, we're not talking about shales only, but we will be talking about a combination of uh, uh, shale reservoirs and uh, and uh, complex reservoirs, which include both conventional and unconventional features in them. So briefly, the agenda of the uh, presentation is as follows. You can probably very quickly read it, but I'll tell you that this is uh, all about the complex unconventional reservoirs. We're gonna be talking about reservoir quality, which includes uh, total organic carbon, TOC, porosity, water saturation considerations. Then we'll be discussing uh, the completion quality, uh, which I refer to as CQ as opposed to RQ, like a reservoir quality versus completion quality. So the completion quality, of course, is all about uh, building 1D mechanical earth models. And if your seismic is good enough, you can proliferate that easily into 3D. We'll be briefly touching the subject of elastic brittleness. That's a pretty controversial subject in our industry. And so I felt obliged to uh, discuss it a little bit too. Then we'll uh, uh, follow with uh, some seismic data utilization and uh, finally draw some conclusions. So what about those complex unconventional reservoirs? Uh, a good example is of course Permian Basin. So we have a juxtaposition of uh, organic shale uh, reservoir strategies with uh, pretty much conventional in the sense of uh, uh, where uh, the porosity and permeability is, conventional reservoirs such as sandstones and carbonates, mostly sandstones. So the, uh, the typical complex unconventional reservoir is a combination of organic mud rocks and tight conventional sandstones and sealstones. I have to claim that uh, so far, even though the industry has done a significant amount of work, a unified landing zone strategy is still missing. So we're gonna be talking about uh, RQ, uh, which is reservoir quality versus CQ, uh, completion quality considerations, 
when selecting uh, landing zones. And we'll finally, uh, we'll uh, discuss the importance of uh, multidisciplinary approach, including petrophysics, rock physics, geomechanics, and maybe even possibly seismic data for developing a landing zone strategy. Throughout the presentation, I'm gonna be operating with a couple of wells that we used in our recent publication in, uh, in the Journal of Interpretation, where uh, Georgianis uh, Del Moro is the fourth author and I am a co-author. And so we're gonna be talking about the well number one and well number two. So well number one is right now on your screen. And for those of you which are familiar with the Permian Basin geology, you can immediately see that I am showing a fragment of the well, which penetrates the bone string formation on the top, then goes into the up, upper bone string interval, which is referred to as Avalon Shale. This is an organic uh, unit uh, interval. And then we go into a succession of uh, bone spring sandstones and carbonates intercalating with each other. Well number one is basically a, uh, a good example of what we're going to be talking about. So we have a, an organic shale unit right here, which has to have a significant amount of organic content. And that's exactly what we are finding here. The TOC ranges between say three to 8%. And if you have a good core data, you can calibrate your TOC model with that and gain a great deal of confidence in the follow-up and all the rest of the workflow that we're gonna be engaging. I have to claim that if the TOC evaluation fails, then pretty much everything else fails. That's the most important parameter to consider, one of the most important parameters. I'm gonna be talking about this interval here, which is uh, represented by Avalon Shale. It's about 800 feet thick. So the 800 feet uh, uh, bar here is just for vertical scale so that you understand what we're talking about. Now the software of RockDoc, which is uh, basically the icon science developed and uh, maintained software is now fully capable to address not only petrophysical but also the rock physics and geomechanics issues associated with unconventional shale reservoirs. So what I'm showing here from uh, uh, wells one, two, and also three and four, which are not uh, gonna be uh, included in the log plots, but they are included in the cross plot. I'm plotting total organic carbon determined from uh, uh, a variety of different approaches, including density and passive approach, against the bulk density from the density log. Superimposed are uh, the RPM rock physics models, which are predicting what would be the combination, what would be the uh, correlation between or relationship between the TOC and the density for a specific range of kerogen or solid organic matter porosity. So the organic matter porosity is calculated based on the organic matter phase only. And if the organic matter is immature, the porosity is assumed to be zero or close to zero. In my experience, most of the time when this RPM is properly calibrated, and the TOC is properly calculated. The data plot somewhere between 10 to 30 or 40 porosity units of kerogen porosity. 
we can complement the same rock physics model with calculation of total porosity. Actually, this rock physics model allows you to do that. And so now the display on the right cross plots the total porosity versus total organic carbon, TOC, and it immediately shows that the total organic carbon is actually controlling the reservoir quality because the higher the TOC in this mature uh, oil window source rock and the reservoir rock, the higher the TOC, the higher the total porosity. You can see that we follow the median trend of about 20% on the kerogen porosity, which is kind of reasonable for uh, the oil window. Now we extend our analysis of well number one, now to compute the porosity, not only in the organic shale unit, but in the bone spring in general. And you can see that there are high porosity sandstones interlayered with low porosity carbonates. So the carbonates here in this gamma ray display are uh, like uh, light yellow and the uh, sandstones are kind of reddish. The lithology column shows uh, that very, very clearly as well. So the amount of carbonate, which is shown as, as a blue image here in the sandstone is relatively suppressed while it may be from 20 to all the way to 80% in limestone units. What's important here is that besides the porosity, the total porosity, we also need to solve for water saturation or oil saturation. And we do so using a dual approach. We do not apply a resistivity-based saturation determination throughout the whole section, recognizing that organic shales do not necessarily agree with Archie or any kind of other uh, resistivity-based water saturation determination. So we are using a, a different approach resistivity free approach which is exemplified by this equation right here for organic shales and by the way i'll note that uh, bk here is the the bulk volume of organic phase in the rock that includes all the solid uh kerogen the bitumen and the associated hydrocarbon filled pores inside of this facing to the opposite, I'm using just a simple Archie equation to solve for oil saturation in more conventional sandstones and limestones. And here, the uh, main uh, component uh, uh, feature of this equation here, besides the water resistivity, uh, the formation resistivity, and the total porosity, is the so-called cementation exponent, M, which is made to be lithology dependent. And only after you do that, you can have uh, some kind of decent uh, uh, estimates of, uh, of your saturation profile, which is shown on the last track. So we kind of identified a couple of phase zones here. Number one is a shale and number two here in, the, uh, in this sandstone. That is a qualification of the reservoir quality RQ. Now we switch gears and start talking about uh, geomechanical issues such as hydraulic fracture modeling, which essentially represents uh, completion quality prediction. So I take this slide from a presentation or book by Wu a couple of years ago. And in it, he shows several models of planar, planar hydraulic fractures that are generated in several stages in horizontal lateral. And I'll mention that uh, uh, the phenomena of planar circular fractures have been introduced some 15 years ago. Then it was successfully forgotten and, uh, and many people started talking about a much more complex fractures that uh, kind of inherit natural fractures in the reservoir only to buy now resurrect the same concept that we already forgotten once 15 years ago. And so now, at least the majority of people that I talk to, and that's what I believe strongly, is that the simple planar circular fractures 
is probably the best representation of the actual hydraulic, hydraulic fractures in more or less homogeneous uh, media. So uh, for a vertical scale, I'll just mention that this model shows the fractures with a diameter of about three to 400 feet, or roughly 100 to 120 meters. I probably have to mention that uh, you can compl complicate uh, this story by introducing a heterogeneous stress state, at least the least horizontal principle stress, SH mean, instead of the homogeneous SH mean as shown in the left example. So if you introduce this complexity in SH mean and you identify some zones of low fracture gradient, like such as shown in here, then the fractures model are gonna be looking totally different. So it's not only that uh, the length and the height of the fracture is going to be different, but also the width of the fracture, which is uh, uh, exemplified by the color. So back into this uh, uh, circular planar fractures, they are not inflated to the same extent as these fractures, which have limited height, but they inflate greater. And that means that they can consume more propane. So the vertically arrested planar fractures result from stress barriers, which are shown on the top and the base. What we can do now is we can try to build some kind of a mechanical earth model, uh, which people refer to as MEMs. And so in 1D, all you need to have is the well log data. So let's say you have a pilot well, you have a vertical well, you have uh, presumably you have a sonic log and a density neutron and resistivity combination run. So it will uh, require a quad combo combination. Uh, and uh, you probably don't need to worry about the anisotropy too much because I'll explain in, in a second that uh, uh, the data set or the database of anisotropy measurements on cores pretty much uh, allows you to relate compression wave velocity to uh, the anisotropy, the VTI anisotropy in unconventional shales. <clears throat> so let me start to uh, explain what this mechanical earth model or, uh, uh, is gonna be based on. So we're gonna be first talking about the SH mean component and uh, you can see that the equation here is pretty straightforward, uh, except I'm adding a stress, tectonic stress component at the end of it. But the most important element of this equation, actually there are two of them, is so-called k naught parameter, stress coupling factor, and the pore pressure. So the k naught is actually given by this equation for anisotropic, highly anisotropic shale. And you can see that all these parameters, C1, C33, C44, can be derived from the vertical well, from P and S wave velocities and density. And the only missing part is delta. Well, the good news is, as explained here in this empirical model, the delta is a good strong function of the P wave velocity. So both of them are controlled by the amount of TOC and amount of clay content in these rocks. Interestingly, for isotropic rock, delta is zero and the stress coupling factor equation is reduced to a simple and well-recognized equation where uh, the nu is the Poisson ratio. And so if we know the VPVS ratio, we can know the Poisson ratio and uh, we apply uh, that to uh, the uh, equation on the top. And voila, we have the SH mean profile generated for the well. I'll stress that K0 and pore pressure are the most leveraging parameters for fracture gradient equation. All right, this is well number one that you already have seen before. 
And now I'm adding two more tracks to it. So I'm building the uh, mechanical earth model. In this case, I'm just showing you the Young's modulus, which is measured perpendicular to bedding, which is E3, and parallel to bedding based on the uh, anisotropic uh, formulation that is available in Rockdog. I'm also assuming that this shale here, the Avalon shale, is in the, in the oil window actively generating oil as we speak. That means it's continually pumped and pressurized. And that's why I allow the pore pressure, the low frequency component, if you will, the, the high wavelength component of this model to be modeled like a bump in the pore pressure. That's what we typically observe in uh, mature source rocks, unless they are over mature. The curve on the right of it is our SH mean, the, higher, uh, the at least horizontal principal stress or fracture gradient. You have a luxury to have D feeds to calibrate the SH mean model. That's great. But unfortunately, very often, we don't have this luxury. So if we don't, then uh, the uncertainties related to this model buildup might be significant. Here's a good example, a recent publication uh, last year, Leading Edge, uh, by Buys et al. And this example comes from the uh, Vaca Muerta formation in Argentina. Well, the company in this case had the luxury to have several defeats in the well, actually more than three. I'm showing you the interval with only three of them, but it has about five defeats downstairs too. What's important is that the pore pressure is pretty unventful and monotonic. And so when they build the, uh, the uh, least horizontal principal stress model, they wanted to calibrate it to the actual ground truth, which are represented by these D feeds points. And you can see that they've done, they've done a reasonably good job at this. So having D feeds is a huge plus for anybody that is trying to build this type of workflow. So now we go to well number two, and uh, you can see that the geology of well number two is not quite the same even though we are showing pretty much the same geological interval from the top of the bone spring formation all the way to the bottom of it, including the Avalon shale in the middle. So what's the difference is that there is a significant interval of about 300 feet of limestone separating two hot shales on the top and the base. So we have an upper Avalon, then we have a carbonate layer, and then we have a lower avalon. So both upper and lower have significant TOC content associated with them and significant oil saturation as well, just like in well number one. We can also see sporadic pay zones in, un in conventional sense, in conventional sandstones, even though very tight sandstones with porosity from 10 to 12, maybe maximum 13, 14%. So what I'm showing here also the compressional and shear wave velocity and density. Then I arbitrarily build, and this is my just an ad hoc representation of what is going on very often in the real world. In this well, we didn't have any pore pressure information at all. So uh, assuming that this is an oil window, hydrocarbon generation is going on right now, I assume that there's a pore pressure buildup against the hot shale zones. And that's what you see in this low frequency red curve. And then on the top of it, I use the equation that I just, just described in the previous slide. And I build my SH mean profile, which is shown on the right. Again, for scale, 800 feet here. So it's about the same thickness of the shale but of course it's totally heterogeneous situation. 
So now uh, let's go back to uh, well number one again. And let's assume that we want to complete a couple of zones inside of the shale unit, which is, by the way, the case in, uh, in other shales, which don't have associated conventional uh, sandstone or limestone intervals associated with them, such as Eagle Fort, Wood Fort, et cetera. So if we want to complete, the good strategy probably would be to use a relatively homogeneous SH mean interval and to assume that we will be generating hydraulic fractures of circular shape and planar uh, in, uh, uh, in plane. I would note that the permeability in the shale is, real, is very, very low. So it's typically less than 100 nano Darcy. So typically in the range between 10 to 100 nano Darcy. As opposed to, uh, for example, the sandstone with the oil saturation, that's another pay zone that the petrophysicists can uh, suggest for completion. And so here we have orders of magnitude higher permeability with all the good things for production indexes and everything else, the implications. But the most important is that if we put the horizontal lateral in it and we'll start doing the fracking, the fractures are not going to be the same as here. They will look more like uh, ellip ellipsoidal features with arrest zones against the stress barriers on the top and the base and a more significant inflation of the fractures so that the fracture width is going to be greater. I wanna uh, start talking about the elastic brittleness now because this concept has been introduced uh, more than 10 years ago and it has been popular in our industry for quite a long time. Even though, you know, from the very beginning I was pretty skeptical about the whole thing. So I wanna spend some time talking about it now. So the concept was introduced by uh, Rickman et al. in 2008, and it basically considers combination of Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio, both statically measured, Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio, in a simplified combination equation. And uh, this equation, according to them, is supposed to yield the so-called brittleness. I would put it, I would call it elastic brittleness because it's not really a brittleness, but it's kind of some kind of an elastic parameter that this authors refer to as brittleness. So what I'm doing here, I'm using the same wells that I uh, uh, showed you before, well number one as an example, and I'm cross plotting my Young's modulus in this case, it's uh, E3 versus Poisson ratio. And the Poisson ratio is calculated assuming there's a, an I, isotropy instead of anisotropy. So what you can see that uh, what I'm plotting this data using TOC as a color code, my organic shales, the Avalon shale, are plotting here. My bone spring sandstones are plotting in the middle, and my bone spring carbonates are on the opposite end of the spectrum. This is what we can do to kind of visualize what's going on. So you can see that the narrow, there's a narrow range of brittleness or elastic brittleness from say 50% to about 62%. So the band between 50% here is a iso brittleness lines. So this is 40, 60. So we're talking about the range between 50 to maybe 60, 62. It's a pretty narrow range to start with. And I claim that because of that, this parameter is not going to be informative enough for us and important enough to design our landing strategy. 
even though I decided that uh, I will go ahead and compute it in the well. And this is well number one again. And uh, uh, right now I'm adding tracks to the same well. So every time you, you, you remember, I started with uh, tracks one through three, then I added a couple of more, a couple of more. So now I'm adding the brittleness, so elastic brittleness track. So let's see what's going on. So let's assume that these are two good candidates for landing in the shale. And then there's a third candidate in the sandstone. So you can see that there is a poor correlation between the elastic brittleness and the lithology, or for the same thing, the stress profile. You know, the stress profile shows relatively homogeneous situation here. This high frequency noise you can disregard, but, but this is showing pretty significant uh, changes like, well, they are relatively significant, of course, because we're still talking about the narrow interval between, you know, like 50% and 62% brittleness. But they do show that. So, would would I like to to take that into account? Probably not. Moreover, in the bone spring uh, sandstone landing zone, half of my pay zone, which is identified by the stress barriers on the top and the base and relatively homogeneous stress story in the middle. This interval is now uh, like a bimodal. The upper part of it shows a significant brittleness or relatively significant brittleness, and the lower part is not. So what do I believe? Well, if I, re if I recollect what I said in the previous slide, that this is not really brittleness, but just another elastic parameter, uh, now we claim that it has a poor correlation with the last, uh, with lithology and stress profile. So I'd rather forget about it. But if I still don't want to forget about it, I will, I'll plot it against the K naught, which I believe is the very, very significant parameter to estimate the completion quality or stress profile. And what I can see here is that K naught shows me a significant differentiation among my lithologies in this bone spring interval, while the differentiation is much poorer and having much less sense if I consider the same K naught parameter and just vary the brittleness in the vertical a bar right here. So what it says then is that the siltstones and carbonates, which are shown in blue and dark blue, would have higher brittleness as compared to my sandstones for the same K naught. Whether or not it makes sense, I will let you to judge. It wouldn't make sense to me. So the conclusion and take to take home uh, uh, preliminary conclusion here is that unlike the stress coupling factor, the elastic brittleness shows poor correlation with the lithology and stress profile. And so I suggest that we just forget about it. Now talking about the true brittleness concept. Well, some 40 years ago, maybe more, a uh, hack and dust from Canada, the two engineers have suggested a very simple ratio of axial strain at the yield point to the axial strain at the failure point that can be derived from any static test, destructive static test on any rock or any kind of material. This is a pretty powerful, even though very simple parameter, and it really relates to brittleness of the rock and how the rock fails. Unlike the previous parameter that I was referring to as elastic brittleness, it has nothing to do with the mode of failure. It's just another elastic parameter or complex elastic parameter that is de derived from the Poisson ratio in Young's modulus. So here's an example from my book, and uh, this is a static test that has been done by the Metarock Laboratory, and uh, uh, it considers a couple of 
uh, example. So a couple of tests here. First test is a model from the Eagle Ford formation having about 4% TOC. And uh, uh, in red, we show a carbonate, uh, a limestone. So the F point is basically the failure point. That's where the ultimate stress is reached and that's where the rock fails. The yield point, the Y point, is where the rock starts to deviate from linearity. So this regime beyond the yield point is intrinsically non-linear and most of the time is not even elastic anymore. So if we go ahead and apply the Hakka's, uh, Hakka and Das uh, criterion here, we we'll compute the brittleness of about 58% in the limestone and about 72% in uh, organic rich marl. So the organic rich marl, the TOC rich marl, shows a higher brittleness than the limestone. Well, if we use, we, all, we also had the luxury to have uh, ultrasonic measurements in these samples. And so we can go ahead and compute the elastic brittleness and the situation reverses. So in this case, the elastic brittleness shows about 53% for the limestone and 39% lower brittleness for the model. I'd rather believe this data than this data. And so the conclusion in general here is that high TOC does not necessarily mean low brittleness, quite the opposite. So where this Rickman uh, paper can apply to, you know, it, it really applies to a situation which is far away from the Permian or any kind of shale reservoir, but where you have an intercalation in the geological cross section of tight conventional shales and tight gas sandstones, such as for example, Colorado Basin, Dijon Basin, Rocky Mountains and stuff. So uh, the typical tight conventional shale will plot somewhere around here with the uh, uh, elastic brittleness of about 45%. Typical tight sandstone would have much higher elastic brittleness and that's why they are more fractured and, uh, and that's why they can be fractured using the hydraulic fracturing technology much easier than those shales. So the concept of elastic brittleness, of course, is an empirical concept. And uh, as such, it can be applicable to certain situations geologically, but definitely not uh, worldwide and uh, across the whole spectrum of diff different geological scenarios. So here I'm plotting three wells uh, in VPVS space. And I'm using Avalon shale, Bakken shale, and Marcellus shale. All three come from, uh, from my data database. Uh, and uh, what you can see that uh, I'm using a template, the rock physics template, that is composed as such that uh, conventional shale line is gray line right here. Three relatively clean sandstones, I call them arenites, clay content less than 10 15%. The lines are red, green, and blue, respectively represent gas, oil, and water saturation. So what's interesting is that uh, this organic shales, which are mature shales with oil or gas in them, like uh, Bakken has oil, Marcellus has dry gas, and Avalon has oil, they all plot and very tight ellipse with a Poisson ratio less than 0.2. That's very low. That is typical of relatively clean sandstones saturated with oil or gas. It's definitely different from the conventional shale line. What we can conclude based on this representation is that the high quartz content, like uh, for example in Avalon shale, it can be 75 to 80 percent quartz, very very small amount of clay and significant amount of organic matter. So the high quartz 
and a high kerogen volume, high TOC, typically suggest low Poisson ratio and hence low stress coupling parameter and high brittleness. One more slide that I wanted to share this afternoon was, uh, can we predict effective stress or pore pressure using any kind of uh, sonic lock technology, P wave data, TOC information? Uh, if we play with rock physics models and rock physics model templates that I show here, so this data set, I'm not going to identify what it is. Uh, it has six wells. It is not from the Permian Basin. Uh, it shows a distribution of very peculiar shape. So you can see that the TOC is going up and one would expect that the, the velocity should go down. At least that's what the rock physics models suggest. But that's not what we see in the well. Thankfully, uh, these rock physics models are smart enough to recognize that this interval right here has much lower clay content as compared to this interval right here. The color coding is a clay content. And so you have an increase in velocity because of the decrease in clay content, even though the TOC is higher in this interval as compared to this interval. What's important to realize is that uh, I show two models here for the red lines. These two RPM models are supposed to handle this high clay interval. The difference between them is only in effective stress or in fact, the pore pressure. So the pore pressure variation between the upper line and the lower line is about 1200 PSI. So can we use POA velocity or in general acoustic impedance, for example, from the, uh, the seismic inversion data in order to say something about the effective stress? And the answer of course is maybe, but only maybe, because we really need to have a good understanding of the mineral composition in both vertical and lateral sense distribution. So short of understanding what the V-clay, quartz content, the carbonate content distribution is in a vertical and a lateral sense, the sensitivity of POA velocity to stress variations in this type of interval, in this type of uh, shales is relatively, really relatively poor. So what's the role of seismic data? Well, I will claim that the limited frequency band, typical of surface seismic, represent a significant limitation in landing zone determination. Even though there are some landing zones that I identified at least the, in the shale, they are on an uh, order of few hundred feet, maybe up to 300 feet. In this case, seismic data can definitely be used. What we can say is that the seismic data is very, very imperative to maintain the proper placement of the well, the lateral well, with respect to the, uh, the boundaries of the landing zone. That's your best bet. What about using seismic data to uh, derive maps of horizontal minimum principal stress? Well, it's definitely doable because we can invert for parameters that relate to K naught. And that means if we know the port pressure, we can uh, come up with the volumes of fracture gradient. We've done that. We published some data, uh, uh, data along those lines. But the most critical element here is the pore pressure. So the pore pressure volume should be also available. And that's, that's, a, that's a limitation. So I'll just show you uh, a one slide here 
that shows a 2D model of uh, uh, synthetic data generated using well number two and well number one. Well, I should have started well one, well number one on the left, well number two on the right. And you can see that the difference in geology, specifically the presence of thick carbonate high impedance layer, creates a great magnification as far as magnitudes of, of amplitudes are concerned in this location as compared to the other location. These seeds identify our respective pay zones. And uh, you can see that, of course, the seismic interval between the top and the bottom of Avalon Shale is relatively thin. Uh, well, it's, it's thick in the, uh, because of the different scale in the log, but it's reduced to a few wiggle traces uh, in the seismic section. Nevertheless, if I know what kind of seismic data I'm dealing with, is that a reflection data, is that a quadrature data, or maybe it's a luxury of had to having a very high quality inversion result. So depending on what I have in hands, I will design a strategy that I will place my well uh, horizontal lateral in the shale zone here, and the shale zone there. So in this case, I'm basically following zero crossing on my seismic amplitude display, reflection coefficient display. If, if for whatever reason I'm using inversion data, I'll probably be following inside of, of my layers because the reflection coefficient is looking at, uh, at uh, the interface uh, properties rather than the properties of the uh, respective layers. That's why simultaneous impedance inversion, such as GIFI or any kind of uh, other ABO inversion, is very helpful. So I'll conclude my presentation with the following statements. Landing zone strategy must incorporate both RQ and CQ. And of course, you already know that uh, RQ stands for reservoir and CQ stands for completion quality. So the reservoir quality includes thickness. We've considered that. Total organic carbon, porosity, and hydrocarbon saturation. While CQ primarily relates to our ability to build models of hydraulic fracture generation. And so those models are predicated on our ability to come up with uh, mechanical earth models. Young's modulus Poisson ratio, least horizontal principal stress. Elastic brittleness, and I put it in quote unquote, is not a trustworthy parameter. It can, uh, can be very misleading in organic shales especially. And finally, seismic data has limited utility in landing zone optimization. But nevertheless, it can be very useful in uh, uh, well placement and also uh, for field-wide stress mapping, talking about the fracture gradient and maybe even pore pressure. So I'm still optimistic. That concludes our, my presentation. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank specifically Icon Science for organizing it uh, and, uh, and conducting this webinar. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lev. Uh, it was, was great, um, very informative. There were some great um, screenshots of RockDoc and some of the um, things that RockDoc can use and be utilized for. Um, I think you've earned a glass of, or at least a sip of your red wine, which I know you've got sitting next to you. Um, what I'm going to do is hand it over to Georgina still tomorrow. Um, she will field the questions. We got some really interesting questions I've, I've seen already, so she'll field those. If there's any additional questions, um, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to put your questions in. We may not get to them all, but uh, we certainly will follow up with any questions and um, we'll get back to you by email or telephone or, or whichever, whichever way. So 
Go ahead, Georgina. Thank you, Barry, for handling the microphone. So, Lev, we actually have a lot of questions from our crowd here. Um, let me start by reading one of the first questions, and it's about the slide with the, one of the initial slides with well one. So this question is from Luis Bravo. He was asking, what does the color bar represent in the wells? Let me go back to those slides and uh, I, I may, may want to use this one, for example. That's good. The color, the color bar in uh, the lithology column represents different mineral compositions. So for example, the slide brown on the left is clay, uh, light blue in the middle is calcite and dolomite, and yellow on the right is quartz, sand. The color code in the TOC track is basically the TOC itself. So the hot TOC is shown like a, a hot color. Uh, and uh, the color code on SHMIN is SHMIN itself. Okay, great, thank you. So let's yep. go to the second question. And this question comes from Julia Tomescus. And the question is, will the presentation be available after the meeting? And I guess that, that question is to that vary. Is, that is icon science to decide. <laughs> yeah. So, Wilia, um, just to answer, answer your question. Yes, the, the, the answer to that question is yes. There may be a, a couple of slides removed for confidentiality reasons, but yeah, we will be providing the, the presentation. So our third question comes from Fries of Bauer, and the question is, what is the SO can, this S -onc, and how do you determine that? Can you repeat? Yeah, what is the S onc? I guess it's saturation in one of your later slides. And how did you determine that? S onc. I'm not sure what I was talking about here. S onc or S O? S O? Thank you. Uh, the question reads as S onc. Where, where is onc? I don't see any oncs in my presentation. So uh, talking Free, about so this S O is a uh, oil saturation. Or if you have just a, a two phase fluid, it's one minus water saturation. Okay. The question comes from the first equation on the second slide. First equation and second slide. Oh yeah, you have it there, left. If you go back to the slide where you were in. Yeah. It's the um, oil saturation of the non kerogen There's no oil saturation here. Uh, go back, uh, go to the equation that you had, you had one. What equation? I don't see any equations here. Uh, go to future slides, I think. Here? Yes, there. Okay. In the oil saturation, right. you have a term there in the equation. You have a term there called S onc. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. That's clear now. This uh, represents oil saturation in a non kerogen phase of the shale. So we, uh, we basically represent any shale as a mixture of two phases, organic and inorganic. And so the oil saturation in uh, uh, organic phase is assumed to be uh, one because uh, we assume the uh, organic phase is fully saturated by the hydrocarbon generated and the water is expelled from the pores completely. Uh, we augment this equation with the possibility to have some oil saturation in inorganic phase as well. Uh, if this term is zero, 
the equation is reduced to a simple form, the Kerogen porosity times Kerogen volume over total porosity. By the way, this form is given in my book. So this equation represents kind of a second step to assume that you might have some insignificant oil saturation in the inorganic phase of the rock. That's a good question. Sorry about uh, a misunderstanding. Okay, thank you, Lev. So the next question that we have is from Jesus Ochoa. And the question is, do you see oil removal ratio increasing in the clay mineral pores from the top and base Avalon as compared to other types of pore types? Can you repeat it, please? Yes, do you see oil removal ratio increasing in the clay mineral pores from the top and base Avalon as compared to other pore types? Oil removal ratio. I'm not sure I understand this uh, uh, parameter. Jesus, if you can extend your question in the chat, we will be more than happy to. I know Jesus and I can, can talk at can talk about it offline because he's a good friend of mine. Great. So um, Jesus, we will take this question offline um, to discuss uh, with you and we will be moving to the next question. Your next question is, can you, per this is from A. Janke and the question is, can you perform a coordinate rotation to be at two BE to have a better correlation with the lithology or TOC? Good question. Let me let me go to that slide. So what? Uh, apparently, we are talking about this slide here. Correct. The BE parameter. Right. So. So I, I'm not rotating anything here, even though I could, but uh, the rotation would represent a uh, total alteration of the parameters. So I'm preserving those parameters as they are specified. So the K naught stands for the stress coupling factor. This parameter is very rigorously defined for elastic rock or elastic media uh, that is stressed with a, a circular hole inside of it. And so it assumes zero lateral strain around the circular hole drilled in the media. And uh, it relates the vertical stress applied to the, uh, the, to the cube. So presumably the vertical gradient, uh, vertical overburden stress uh, to the horizontal uh, stress component. So now BE is a specific parameter that is, you know, just a com combination of Young's modules and the Poisson ratio. So in general, yeah, you can do any kind of uh, rotations on any kind of elastic parameters, but they will choose, they will lose their sets. What people typically do is at least as a, uh, you know, QI geophysicist, I have done lots of time, is rotation of my impedances, uh, impedance cross plots. So to find an optimal separation between say sands and shales or uh, water saturated sands from uh, hydrocarbon saturated sands. But I don't see any specific need or information derived from the rotation in this specific cross plot. And just to add on left answer, uh, we can actually uh, use rock dock in the way to start cross plot and we can rotate the axis of any other property and that projection distance to the rotation of the axis you can actually take that property and if you're looking to discriminate between high volume of quartz versus low volume of quartz then you can use that projection distance as an attribute to plot against your seismic volumes or however you characterize these properties that's exactly right George. So uh, the next question that we have is from Colin Sayers, Sawyers. Uh, 
And the question, Colin says that left, it wasn't a very interesting talk. And one thing that you didn't mention are the polo elastic coefficients you denoted by beta, the horizontal and vertical, and how are you estimating these parameters? Good question. Uh, I didn't have time in this talk to talk about the nitty gritty details of uh, rock physics here. But what my good friend Colin is referring to here on this equation that I'm pointing right now to the parameter beta V and beta H. H stands for horizontal or bedding parallel. V stands for vertical or bedding normal. And the beta parameter is the BO parameter. And uh, as far as uh, stresses are concerned, uh, the BO parameter is typically derived from uh, the combination of uh, matrix and uh, a bulk mod moduli of both dry frame. So if you know the modules of dry frame and you know the, the properties, uh, the bulk modules of the matrix of the, of the, matrix of the rock, uh, you can theoretically predict the BO coefficient. Having said that, uh, I probably need to stress that uh, uh, very often this specific equation is not used in a rigorous theoretical sense of the word, but uh, massaged to be empirical fit to the observations. So for instance, uh, if I change my beta B or BO coefficient for vertical direction, pretty significantly from being equal to one, most of the time with reasonable values of K naught, and that's what uh, rock properties that we log in a well, and pore pressure, and the tectonic stress, we are just not able to recover the accurate representation of the SH mean that can be you know, verified by defeat tests. So in this sense, this equation, and that, that's on, sometimes this equation is referred to as Eaton equation, you know, but this is not Eaton equation in, the, in a, a theoretical sense of the world. This is a theoretical equation, but uh, uh, it can be forced to be sort of like an empirical concept if we play loose with the BO coefficients. We still need to allow, and that's what I do here in this representation, that uh, BO coefficient normal to bedding should be greater than the one parallel to bedding. So in other words, uh, there's a constraint inequality. Uh, beta B is greater than beta H. Thanks for your good question. Thanks, Lev. The next question comes from Diana Allard. And uh, Diana question says, you mentioned about the core data and the integration in the interpretation. What data would you consider fundamental for an integrated RQ, reservoir quality, and CQ, completion quality characterization? Excellent question. In unconventional shale reservoirs, the two most important parameters, or maybe groups of parameters, uh, the rocky Val data, pyrolysis data on the core samples that will give you both the total organic carbon and the level of organic maturity uh, of the rock. In other words, is that oil, wet gas, dry gas window? Uh, this is uh, as far as uh, TOC and rocky Val. You, you also will benefit from uh, crashed rock, porosity measurements, and maybe sometimes saturation, even though I have less confidence in saturation compared to the total porosity determination from uh, the crashed core samples. As far as uh, uh, completion quality is concerned, you know, probably the best, the best parameters to know and uh, to appreciate are uh, the static Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio. And so if you could be able to derive that accurately in a vertical sense in the pilot well, to see the difference in uh, Young's modules and Poisson ratio between uh, adjacent layers, that what's driving 
the determination of the uh, fracture gradient. And that what determines significant stress barriers that can impose the boundary conditions on your uh, hydraulic fractures. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lev. Um, just to add into that question from Diana, um, you can do all the calibration between dynamic to static module, moduli in RockDoc under the geomechanics functionalities. So uh, the next, is that a question? Just to add into your answer. Oh, you, oh you're adding to my answer? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Okay, our next question is from an anonymous attendee. And the question is, in your opinion, would you add or change any factors in the brittleness equation you discussed earlier? Uh, the answer is, I know what the exact brittleness is. Uh, I mean, theoretically defined. Uh, nothing in common with this equation here, and not only this, but also very little in common with this equation here. So this equation shows the actual brittleness or relative brittleness defined by these two Canadian engineers. The brittleness that I discussed in the previous couple of slides deals with uh, just uh, another elastic parameter, which sometimes may uh, sometimes and most often has nothing to do with the real brittleness of the rock. The, the brittleness refers to the failure mode of the rock and the elastic properties refer to their linear, linear elastic strain response to the stress uh, loading. So you can obviously see the difference and disconnect here. But the true brittleness parameter that has not been discussed in this presentation, so stay tuned, maybe Maybe next time we'll talk about it. Thank you, Lev. Yep. The next question is from our colleague, Alfonso Quaglia, who provided uh, the digitized data for many of this work. Sure. The question is, wouldn't you include the other brittleness you show different than the elastic brittleness into the reservoir quality parameters besides thickness, TOC, porosity, and hydrocarbon saturation? Uh, no, I, I think it was obvious from my presentation that I would not do that because it's just misleading parameter and most of the time will mess you up rather than inform you of anything good. Cool. Great, thank you, Lev. Our next hey, question. Hey, jo Georgianis, Georgianis, sorry to interrupt. Um, we, we're actually going a bit, well, we're already over time, but what I suggest we do, and I think every science and social event, we always run over time, so we will run over, but we limit it to two more questions, and then okay. we'll, we'll wrap it up. Is that uh, okay with you and, and Lev? I'm fine. And then yeah. I'll, I'll add that any question that is unanswered, we will get back to you, so don't, don't worry about that. But So pick the two best questions, George Ennis, and we'll, we'll, then we'll finish. Okay, our next question is from Yuda Yushendri. I'm sorry for the mispronunciation of your name. Uh, but the question is, how do we estimate pore pressure from inversion results if feasible? Well, that's a bird in the sky right now. Uh, and uh, I believe nobody knows how to do it even though we have theoretical hints how to do it. And so this specific slide is designed to show those hints to you. So we are talking about the ability to use elastic data, for example, P wave velocity or acoustic impedance or a combination of AISI to say something about the uh, uh, pore pressure or overpressure of the rock. So what I'm showing you here is uh, a pretty significant uh, pressure differential between the two realizations of the model, more than 100 PS, 1,000 PSI. Uh, and yet, these two models are running pretty close to each other. 
So you can imagine that uh, any kind of error in uh, clay content or carbonate content or words content uh, in the section, in your ability to constrain those volumetrics, mineralogical volumetrics, will totally disqualify any kind of inversion for pore pressure from seismic inversion data. So I'm at this moment, I, I'm still pretty skeptical, but we are uh, working on it and hopefully we can solve this issue from practical point of view, as well as uh, 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 along the lines that we kind of solve this, this problem from the theoretical point of view using the RPMs. Just to add into Lev uh, comment, um, Judah, we actually have put together a paper on estimating pore pressure on the in the Permian Basin, actually, in which we combine um, machine learning and also we combine a little bit of the work um, that Lev uh, has done with our pore pressure team, and we can send that to you after the questions are. This presentation is over. Um, the next question is last from question. the last question, yeah. And then I will answer a, a, one, a, my third and last question, which was a funny one in the chat. Um, I'm going to get to the question from Neptali Rekena. And the question is, what is the most recommended seismic technique to predict fracture density and orientation in unconventional place? Fracture density and orientation. Correct. Well, again, theoretically, we know how to do it. Practically, from surface seismic data, it has been generated in a few publications over the last couple of years. That is totally unfeasible. So you just cannot use any kind of surface seismic data to say anything meaningful about uh, the fracture orientation or density. Okay, well, thank you. And my last question, it was the funny one, and that I guess is not for left, it's for everyone. Can my computer get coronavirus? Well, I hope your computer doesn't get coronavirus, and, ho <laughs> and I hope that none of you get coronavirus. And please, uh, thank you so much for joining us in this Science and Social Cheers for being resilient in these difficult times. We're all going to come out from it. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Lev. And cheers to all of you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll say one more thing, Georgenis. We, we will follow up with an email to everybody that participated and, um, and uh, possibly contact you about your, your feedback in terms of the, the presentation. And if you've got any questions regarding RockDoc, and one final thing, I'll put a little plug in for Lev. If you can see my screen, this is a very, um, very famous book that Lev wrote that I believe has been the, the best-selling book for SEG for, for the last couple of years. So um, if you haven't already got it, you should get it. And most of the, the equations that are in the book are actually implemented in the RockDoc uh, platform. So um, buy the book, understand the book, but better still buy Brockdock and use the, the equations uh, as you need. With that, have a great I'll, evening. I'll, I'll, I'll add to it that uh, the Rockdock has more than my book contains in it. Okay, right great. So everybody stay safe and um, hopefully we can all do this as a, as a real event as opposed to a, a virtual event um, soon. But uh, in the meantime, we'll keep, uh, we'll keep going. Thank you, Barry. Thanks all, bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you, bye. -bye.